So I want to read Mendelssohn together. Um, I think before I read it, though, I just want to take a look at this. From what I just heard from you people, you don't have this letter to Lavatar. So I'll just uh, read this letter to Lavatar to you, at least some excerpts from it, because um, it's illustrative of his way of thinking, and I think it uh, also um, uh, is a clear description of Mendelssohn's thinking in key areas. Then we can go back and look through his actual philosophical text. Jerusalem is a philosophical text, which is actually a work of the Enlightenment. It's a John Locke type, type text, and uh, I think um, Mendelssohn even shows some awareness of the American Revolution that's going on in that text. He's writing it around the time of the American Revolution. This Lavatar was a um, Christian minister who um, had been a friend and intimate with Mendelssohn. And Mendelssohn, and he had challenged Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn kept uh, company in all the salons of uh, Berlin, uh, all the modern salons. You see, in this period, as I tried to explain in the, um, when we were just looking at the Maimon material, um, the whole region, you want to say, all of Central Europe, I suppose extends up into places like Denmark, over into Holland. I'm not so sure uh, what France was thinking, but I'm sure France, the French Revolution, had a lot of this uh, being uh, considered, discussed. But I think more so in the Protestant area than in because the Catholic area is still dealing with the grip of the uh, organized church, which is a very strong grip. Uh, so I think places like England, Northern Europe, and so on were more susceptible to this than, let us say, uh, France, which has, though Paris is a very avant-garde sort of place, uh, France can be certainly very conservative in other areas. So uh, a lot has to do with the Reformation, the Renaissance, and, and things growing out of that period. Um, so this period then was known as the Enlightenment, where you had this new thinking. A lot of it was based on the idea of um, natural religion. Natural religion. And that gave, uh, that was considered religion discoverable by the process or use of reason. That if it was in, we don't mean natural in the sense that we're talking about, oh, that's a natural person. We, we mean it's in nature. It's discoverable through look, observe, observing nature, just like the laws of physics are discoverable by observing nature or the natural surroundings. So that you can bring your, your, your reason to bear on uh, your environment. You should be able to discover certain principles. Out of this idea comes a whole um, development of the notion of natural rights, natural law. That there were certain unalienable rights, natural rights that every man had. It's in the American uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, uh, presented by uh, thinkers, particularly Jefferson and Franklin and people of that kind, who were already being influenced by this kind of thinking in Europe. That every man had certain unalienable rights. Oh, there's a, a large uh, precursor to the modern age, as you know, which again has to do with this Islamic debate that we're dealing with now. I mean, it, this is a very difficult situation, as I said, because they're not willing to go through what's necessary to come into the modern age but they have all the accoutrements of the modern age that can be purchased. And they can use uh, the Western um, uh, civilized uh, civilization, I mean, the way I mean by that, the way the West works against itself because of the Achilles heel of the uh, economy and the uh, oil uh, 
flow. So countries that are not sophisticated or um, avant-garde intellectually speaking can, um, because of the control of natural resources, can use the uh, economic weapon against the very countries that have produced these things. It's a very, uh, very, very, very frightening situation. I can't, I can't even communicate to you how much it frightens me, but I think I've done that in many classes so far. So if I'm so bugged about it and I'm 60 some odd years old, you can imagine um, how frightening I perceive it as being and how the average person isn't frightened as far as I can see. But uh, it is a terribly frightening situation to be in, you know, what we face. Other situations you could, you know, draft a 20 million man army and fight. Uh, but I don't know if that's possible to do with this situation at the moment. Uh, in any case, um, the West then had this huge precursor in these kinds of philosophies after uh, the um, basic uh, separation of church and state, which it came to the quote, which Mendelssohn was going to be writing about. So one of the uh, fundamental principles was natural religion, natural law, natural rights. All these should be discoverable through reason. And then out of um, That's what natural as opposed to supernatural. What's supernatural religion in this context, let's say? Revealed it's religion. Revelation. Yeah, revelation, revealed religion. They see the whole Middle Ages prior to that, the scholastic synthesis. People like Aquinas, but they were basing their thinking on Maimonides. And Arab thinkers like Al-Farabi and Averroes and people like that, Ibn Rushd, were, were talking about the harmony of philosophy and religion. That, and you'll see Mendelssohn still is gripped by that kind of thing. That all philosophy does is discover the truths of religion <laughs> in a longer process, whereas uh, uh, revealed religion just gives the truth immediately to the people. But that should be discoverable by reason. There shouldn't be any conflict between reason and religion. That was called the scholastic synthesis. How many are familiar with that? That's what was going on in the Middle Ages under Aristotelian uh, influence. Did Martin Luther see the separation of church and state? Did he agree to it? I'm not sure. I really am not. Uh, yeah. I think he agreed to whatever promoted his uh, approach to things. So probably because it saved his life. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't think he really agreed with separation of church. And no, state. he did not agree with separation. No, I, I don't think he would really agree with it. So I can't. But why? Why did? this new way of thinking come out of Well, the this has nothing to do with the Reformation. This comes out of the Renaissance. This is, this is before Martin Luther. Martin Luther's a product of this. This is not the new way of thinking isn't the Reformation. Protestantism comes out of things like Martin Luther, okay, but the Martin Luther is coming out of the Renaissance and things like that where people are rediscovering Greek learning and that's going all the way back to um, these medieval philosophers like uh, Ibn Rushd and um, other Arab uh, people who are studying Aristotle and Plato and things like that and then communicating it to the West. That's a whole other but, process. But, but you uh, said earlier that if the Reformation area seemed to be the... Yeah, but that's not all Martin Luther. Um, the Protestant countries were developing all over Northern Europe, um, in Scotland, in England, and uh, it wasn't just Martin Luther in Germany. They were all being influenced by uh, some questioning of authority. Rationalist focus on the individual. Well, I mean, I don't go and go any, go any further. I don't know. I mean, what was? But I don't think. Uh, I think they were products of this ferment that was going on. And then in the secular area, this was the so-called enlightenment. I don't think you'd call Martin Luther an enlightened person, and I don't think you would call him part of the enlightenment. He would be influenced, if you like, to challenge uh, uh, papal authority by the principles of the. Uh, 
a, a philosophical enlightenment, I would imagine, but I don't think he was a, a person who was uh, wedded to those principles. I mean, it's complicated, nothing is simple. But I mean, you have to understand the enlightenment is more in the framework of people like Galileo, who were before Martin Luther, uh, or maybe contemporaries of Martin Luther. Uh, Galileo is probably contemporary of Martin Luther. Uh, but even before that, you know, the whole Renaissance, it's humanism before that, the, 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 the discovery of humanistic learning, which starts the separation of church and state. That all learning is not necessarily church learning. That's what you meant by humanistic. And that's the 13th century Petrarch and uh, uh, Dante and uh, uh, people like that. So um, Boccaccio, uh, uh, and then there are people like uh, Michelangelo and different painters of that kind that are coming along and are doing subjects that are not church subjects. Look at Michelangelo's Dawn and Dust. They're basically pagan subjects. David maybe is a, a nod to uh, that. Even David's an Old Testament figure. Moses and so on uh, are nods maybe to some church things. But the Sistine ceiling is like, my God, it's nudes, uh, Greek torso nudes, uh, all of it from a rediscovery of uh, Greco-Roman uh, art and, uh, and sculpture. And nothing to do with uh, Christianity whatsoever. So um, not just uh, Michelangelo, but architecture and so on. I was going, that's the Renaissance. That's the, uh, what they call the Quattrocento and the, and the Cinquecento, the 14th, 15th centuries. That's when things are really cooking up. Uh, humanism in the 1300s and so on. So this is a slow process. So by um, the um, 16th, 17th centuries, you're, you're into this uh, enlightenment thinking, as they call it. Again, I'm, you get this in a philosophy course, which is supposed to, I think, count in the philosophy area. It used to. I don't know where it counts at the moment, but it used to count in that area, which is why we have some of this material here. But in any event, by the time of the 18th century, 17th, 18th century, you're into natural right, natural law, Hobbes, everything is a state of nature, 17th century. And then out of everything being a state of nature, people rob, kill, murder, brutalize each other as far as Hobbes is concerned. You get, you surrender a certain amount of liberty as far as Hobbes is concerned in order to become part of a society. It's called a social contract. You make a contract with the society to give up some of your rights to be protected by that society. Otherwise, everyone would just be raping, robbing, murdering, according to Hobbes, would be killing and be total raping. And he's in the period of the civil wars in England. That's how he saw it. Milton is a contemporary of Hobbes, and, uh, and um, um, Newton as well. Uh, great renaissance occurring in England at this time. Erasmus in Northern Europe is the previous century. Very scholastic minded people. So I don't think Luther is the key person in any of this. It's just that Luther is involved in the ultimate split within the church into a more, shall we say, rational approach to a less rational approach. Although that wouldn't be, most people think Luther's not very rational. So, I mean, uh, again, that's another fact that you have Protestant countries. I mean, you don't have individual authority anymore. You don't have, um, you know, a single person who is, um, can't be mistaken. What's the word that they call them? Infallible. Infallible. Well, that's what you're talking about. But that's another process. And when I said north and south, yeah, Protestant countries would be more apt to be tolerant of individual um, lack of conformity than a more uh, than a society where um, you have someone who's supposed to be infallible pronouncing judgments. I think that's what you're confusing. Protestantism and Luther and people like that with philosophical enlightenment, which is 
going side by side, but not necessarily in total agreement with each other. You know that Protestant churches today are, some of them very fundamentalist minded, so they're not really into individual liberty at all, you see. Many of them in a more modern period. And so you say, how can that be? Well, one of the reasons is that they substituted the word of God for papal authority. And the word of God was to be discovered in the book. So their authority was the book, which gave each person the right to carry the book and be his individual arbiter of the book. Whereas in Catholicism, you have more catechism, teaching of the, the way the church approaches things. But the book wasn't the arbiter in Catholicism for a long time. I don't think I'm an expert in these areas. I'm trying to clarify them from a simplistic viewpoint, since you're asking. But, um, you can get a tyranny of the word then. You know, whereas originally the word made everybody free of, a, of authority. So that's why in America, you out in the frontier, you had the, the book on everyone's table. The book was the final determinant. Now, if you didn't question the book, because the book was what? The word of God. That's why we professors get into trouble with fundamentalist minded people, because we go around saying, well, you've got made a mistake here, made a mistake there, uh, <laughs> screwed up in this passage, messed this passage up, and so on. So they don't like that kind of approach. So that gets into, because it's undermining their authority principle. But originally I think their authority principle was very noble and um, uh, 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 liberal in the sense that uh, they said each man is his own king. Man, I'm sorry we didn't include women here, but at that time women weren't as independent-minded and in a situation as they are today, as you know. I mean, uh, uh, look at the Mormon situation in, you know, last century, and you can see that that's an offshoot of certain Protestant uh, thinking and um, other kinds of things of that kind. Uh, so, I mean, women were not in a totally equal free situation uh, until, I'm not, I don't know what the situation is today, I wouldn't even want to comment on it. In any event, um, so originally I think that was a very uh, noble thing that empowered the individual to be his own, he could read the book himself. That's why you translated the book into what? Into the, into, into the languages that people spoke. So you didn't get a curia. What was uh, Maimon just talking about? He was talking about the fact that the Jews have for a long time been run by what? Well, I don't want to call it a curia, but an aristocracy of rabbinic teachers who interpreted the word and that was that. And if you didn't know the languages that they knew and you weren't part of the, you know, clique or uh, coterie or fellowship that they enjoyed, you basically had to defer or uh, you were out. I'm going to go back to Spinoza in a moment because he's he's out, as we'll see, because he's kind of like a free thinker. In any event, um, so you have um, these people who are emphasizing the word as being infallible, and then you, you, you carry the book, and so they're the ones who interpret the word. They're not told how to interpret the word yet by organized bodies. Those come, may become later in the different Protestant groups. So that's a very um, invigorating, uh, heady kind of individualism that develops, starts off there. And that can give way then in the kind of thinking that you're talking about into other areas that is, that you start to think for yourself in these areas. People like Hobbes and others are already moving over there. And so what Hobbes is saying that uh, the world is a state of nature and so on, I think uh, Mendelssohn knows Hobbes. Uh, and so that develops into his and Rousseau's social contract theory. It's very famous, if you haven't heard of it. The next step is the social contract. I can't teach all of philosophy and history of uh, modern Jewish uh, uh, tradition and thought and so on. And 
what happened to the Jewish people in the last two or three centuries. But um, you see how this idea gets going. Now, the American Declaration of Independence is a perfect social contract document. What does it say? Something like, when governments are abusive of these rights, something like that, people have the right to overturn them or something like that. Um, what's the actual language I can't remember? Governments are instituted above among men to provide life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When the governments become abusive of these rights, the people, you see it starts off with there are certain unalienable rights. <laughs> I think it says among these, it's a the perfect document, our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In France it was called liberty, fraternity, egalité, fraternity, liberty, equality, brotherhood. I, I, you know, <laughs> I think the American was much more of uh, Pioneering, <laughs> pursuit of happiness. Get out of my way. <laughs> don't get in the way of my pursuit of happiness. I don't get in the way of your pursuit of happiness. But fraternity, I don't see any fraternity in that. <laughs> Pardon me for laughing. <laughs> I always uh, had a suspicion. You know, there's a certain Catholicism left in the in the French approach. You know, the solidarity of the church community, the fraternity, if you like, of the brotherhood within the church uh, and so on of a common culture. But America had already abandoned that one and uh, had gone the way of independence, uh, you know, pioneer, frontier spirit, if you want to call it that. So, uh, and Jefferson, you know, lived on the edge of the frontier. That's where he lived out there in basically West Virginia was the frontier. He lived on the edge of the mountains there. And what ultimately became after where he was in Charlottesville, West Virginia. How many were familiar with that part of the country? Well, that's basically the mountains there, and that's where anything went, you know. Once you got beyond the mountains, nobody had control of you. You know, that's, that's the way it went. So, um, social contract is a, is a key, um, part of this new theorizing that is expressed within the Declaration of Independence of the United States. So the governments are there by the leave and permission of the government. They make a contract to give up their wild ways as long as the government uh, agrees not to abuse them. When the government, like you think Bush is abusing you, okay, then we got to change the government. Uh, maybe he is, I don't know. Now we're having the torture problem in America. Should we torture people who want to blow us up or shouldn't we? Uh, God, I don't have the answer to it. You know, I don't know what the right way to go on some of these issues are, but the point is uh, these are still the same kind of issues. What is abusive? What is, what is uh, governments going beyond the, the, what's allowed them by the social contract, by the Declaration of Independence, if you want to, mm -hmm. want to call it that. And the social contract of the American government is uh, uh, embodied in the Constitution. The Constitution is adopted by the vote of the people. We the people, we the people, we're the arbiters, we the people, agree that these are, this is the contract. You follow me? So that's why, uh, you know, I, 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 again, I hate to keep going back to this problem. If people come to this country, and don't put Thomas Jefferson and the American Constitution over their religious attachments, there's a problem. Because that's what this country is founded on. You can't put your loyalty to your religion or other things above the Constitution of the United States. And if you do, then you're not really an American citizen in the classic sense of the word. And uh, we're finding that issue. Now, most people who came here admired the American Constitution, wanted to, uh, you know, wanted to put it first. But we now have some other situations developing, and uh, we're not used to it, and the people are not ready for it. I don't have, again, any solution to these problems. Yeah? Where would be a place that the Constitution and someone's religion come into conflict? Hmm. 
Oh, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> Mendelssohn will go into that for you. He, he, he's talking about where the religion comes into conflict with the, uh, uh, with the society and uh, where you stand on that. But, um, you know, even Kennedy had to say that he would put the American Constitution over his uh, loyalty to his religious background. If he didn't, he never wouldn't have gotten elected president. He, he had to commit that. He had to make that commitment. And uh, I think Jews automatically do that anyway uh, over centuries and centuries. That when they're given citizenship in a country, they value it so much that they are prepared to surrender an awful lot for that. Uh, the thing, the problem with the Muhammad situation is very clear. Muslims feel Muhammad is above anything that you're doing, <laughs> and, and, and that's a real, a real conflict. And they are obliged to think that because they don't have. To, they're obliged. It's in that you can't speak ill or anything of the prophet or whatever or disagree. You can be executed for that. So uh, it's a very serious problem, and, and I don't. Again, uh, it's something that I don't know what the outcome. You'll see the outcome when you're my age. Let me know. Send me a letter, okay? Because <laughs> I have no idea where this is going to go. I have, but I don't think it's going to go well. That's my own feeling. I don't think it's going to go well. And, uh, as I keep telling you, that, that you'll tell me when it's all done what happened. Uh, but this wasn't, uh, you know, Jews, for instance, uh, like Mendelssohn and people like that were so thrilled to uh, be part of the society and get be considered citizens, that they were willing to, uh, you know, basically totally separate church and state. Now, let me just, just look at this one thing here that I mentioned. Here we have the Jews of um, Amsterdam, Sephardi community of Amsterdam, the writ of excommunication. You don't think of Jews as excommunicating anyone. Now, this was very much in Mendelssohn's mind. This happened in the previous century. He knew about this. Um, the Senhors of, I don't know who, Mahamad, I don't I get this, make it known that they have long since been cognizant of the wrong opinions and behavior of Baruch de Spinoza and tried various means and promises to dissuade him from his evil ways, but as they effected no improvement, obtaining on the country more information every day of his horrible heresies, which he practiced and taught, and of the monstrous actions which he performed, and as they had many trustworthy witnesses who in presence of the same as Spinoza reported and testified against him and convicted him, and after all this has been investigated in the presence of rabbis, they decided with the consent of these that this same Spinoza should be excommunicated and separated from the people of Israel, as they now excommunicate with him with the following ban. And they write this ban here, and I don't have time to read it all. We order that nobody should communicate with him orally or in writing, or show him any favor, or stay with him under the same roof, or come within four whatever L's are, this distance of maybe four feet or meters of him, or read anything composed or written by him. Oh, what would induce a society to take such an extreme measure? Oh, they were frightened, like Jews nowadays may be frightened, that they're blamed for the opinions of a single person. Then all the Jews get blamed for it, like what happened in Europe in the last century. A lot of Jews became socialists. So then everyone said uh, uh, socialism is a Jewish philosophy. Uh, and then Karl Marx, who was a convert to Christianity, was one of the fathers of communism with Engels. Engels was not Jewish. Uh, Marx was, uh, you know, again, someone whose father had converted him to get ahead in Christian society. He was not, uh, he was not Jewish. He even wrote a book called A World Without Jews which he himself thought Jews were the bankers, <laughs> and he meant by world without Jews, uh, world without uh, capitalists. <laughs> well, you know, he was as nutty as, 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 as everybody else, and uh, doesn't read Marx to know how nutty he is, but uh, a lot of people swear by him as a religion and so on. Well, the thing is that Jews uh, were blamed for all of these ideas, and then things like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion were written by the Russian Tsar of Secret Police that were pilfered from a, a, a document that had, that had been written against the uh, French uh, Louis Napoleon, uh, uh, Napoleon's uh, grand-nephew, 
who had become Emperor of France for a while in the 1850s. And that document was written against him, but the Tsarist police transferred everything to a Jewish conspiracy, not a Napoleonic conspiracy, to, to take over mankind and had the elders of Zion meeting and they circulated this thing. And people like Hitler read it and Arabs in the Middle East read it now. It's published in all the Muslim countries and so on. People in Japan read it as if this is historical fact and so on. So the Jews, what am I saying? The Jews in Amsterdam were frightened of people like Spinoza's views would be blamed on them. So they wanted, they didn't kill him. They didn't do what uh, was done in Italy to uh, different people. What was, there, uh, what was the name of the one that was thinking for Giordano Bruno or uh, put under arrest like Galileo for his whole life, not allowed to step out of his house again and so on, only could be served by his daughter. Uh, they didn't do that to him. They just said, look, don't associate with him, and uh, we want everyone to know we have nothing to do with this guy. But they're not saying, like, in the present day, go out and kill him, send out secret assassins or something, which is what we're witnessing in today's world. They were even more civilized than that, even though we consider this benighted. They weren't sending out assassins to kill Spinoza, which I'm sure they could have done. They're just saying, yeah, he's not, he's not one of us. You know, he's under ban. You know, uh, we don't want to be blamed for these. And it, it was rationalism that he was, uh, that he was, that he was spreading. I haven't read every work of Spinoza. I have to admit. Yeah. Do you think Spinoza was influenced by Maimonides? Some influenced by Maimonides, but I think he went further than Maimonides. Because Maimonides was really under the sway of Aristotle. Aristotle. Yeah, really under the sway of Aristotle. Maimonides isn't as rational as he seems, you know. And, uh, you know, he, he, he went through some scrutiny, though. He's quite, he's pretty good. He's quite sophisticated, but, you know, he owes an awful lot to the Muslim philosophers like him that came before. I mean, I mean yeah, Maimonides is a contemporary of Ibn Rushd Averroes. They both have similar works. Averroes is even more rational than, you know, rationalist than Maimonides. Maimonides is like uh, Al Farabi. I used to be an expert in this stuff, but since I came to Cal State, I never had a chance to teach it. And so, uh, uh, you know, in Cal State, you can only teach what people want to enroll in. So uh, I never had a chance to really teach it. So I lost my control of a lot of this kind of material. Um, That's that one. Hey, yeah, this works. Hey, what do you think? <laughs> this is a funny system. Whiteboards. Uh, Al Farabi was the um, Muslim philosopher closest. He was a 10th century uh, Muslim philosopher from Baghdad who was very Aristotelian. And I think Maimonides is just a Jewish version of Al Farabi. And also there was another one in Persia after Al Farabi called Ibn Sina, who was called in the West Abyssinia. He's not quite as rationalist as Al Farabi. Al Farabi is even more rationalist than Ibn Sina, even though Ibn Sina is a little later. That's um, Ibn Sina is the I think 1000s, 11th century. Farabi is the 900s, 10th century. I think I've got that right. Maybe all this. And Maimonides is the 12th century, maybe 13th, you know, at the time of uh, Richard the Lion, I guess it's in the 13th century, uh, 1200s, early 1200s, Saladin and so on. So Spinoza sure is reading all those people for sure, and he's familiar with all those people, but he's obviously going further. He's got a, a work on the um, Tractatus um, Religio something or other. This is very interesting, questioning the Bible and uh, applying a very rationalist uh, exegesis to the Bible and so on. Very interesting. Anyway, what happened to um, Mendelssohn, who, like Solomon Maimon that we just read, had, had, had really become very conversant in all these things and was then, because he published himself, recognized as part of this uh, group of Enlightenment people. He had kept company with a lot of enlightened uh, people, including ministers and others. And this Caspar Lavatar, who uh, we have this letter to in my work here, which you don't have in yours. 
which is the weakness of uh, using new publications and putting new wine and old wineskins, or old wine and new wineskins, I don't know which. Uh, so we don't have the harmony and consistency of documents. Anyway, he, he wrote a letter to this Lavater fellow, uh, and it's really interesting. Lavater said, well, if you think the things you think, why don't you convert to Christianity? Why are you, and Mendelssohn was outraged because he felt that this fellow person had abused his personal confidence. A second thing, he never wanted to be excommunicated like uh, Spinoza had been. And that was something he always had before his eyes. And in, in Mendelssohn, all these things, the secular religious approach, were in a fine harmony, a fine balance. He, one did not go out of balance with the other. So by the time of his children and grandchildren, as I told you, they all converted to Christianity. So he said, what's wrong with that? They should have. No, because Mendelssohn had too much respect for his heritage and his past to do that. And, and he didn't think that just to take the easy way out and disappear into another society was the honorable way to go. It was a matter of uh, honor, dignity. I mean, your people have uh, struggled to survive and to resist and to be uh, a unique uh, cultural uh, heritage for thousand, two thousand years, what, you just chuck it away in one moment? You don't have uh, any respect for your uh, heritage, for your, for your past, uh, uh, your, the dignity of what others before you felt and suffered and went through? These are the things I think that really matter. These things I come on children. Uh, you know, you, you unfortunately have an obligation, whether you like it or you don't like it. You can't just, uh, you know, abandon things. Uh, you can try to make them better, but you can't just uh, you know, cut up, cut out. Anyway, so Lavater knew his private views on a lot of things, and therefore challenged him. And, he's, and um, um, Mendelssohn was incensed that his private, maybe opinions or uh, confidences had been. A public and abused like this in a public manner. So here's what he said. You have found it advisable, friend, to dedicate your translation of this particular French work to me. And to request, this gives you an idea of Mendelssohn's dignity and character, and to request me publicly and solemnly to refute this treatise if I felt that its arguments in support of the claims of Christianity were erro erroneous. This was a treatise in French of the proofs for Christianity. This guy had translated into German, I guess. Should I, however, find the arguments convincing, you ask me to do what wisdom, love of truth, and he quotes your honor require. And what a Socrates would have done had he read the treaties and found it irrefutable, namely to abandon the religion of my fathers and to embrace the faith advocated by Monsieur Bonnet. See, he, he, I understand Mendelssohn, and he, he speaks something that I just spoke to you, I, I feel. I'm not trying to put myself in his company. For even if I were ever tempted to stoop so low, I mean, now you see, people who are Christian background will say, well, 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 what's your problem? <laughs> well, it's a matter of abandoning your heritage. Even if you were ever tempted to stoop so low as to place expediency over above my sense of truth, even if that were the case, and I, or if that's what his, uh, his descendants obviously did, and probity. My course of action would, in this particular case, obviously be dictated by all three elements. I am convinced your motives in asking me to do this are pure, reflect nothing but your loving concern for your fellow man. Indeed, I should not be worthy of any respect if I did not gratefully reciprocate the affection and friendship for me that are evident in your dedication and your inscription. Apparently, the fellow dedicated this to you. Yet I must confess, your action has shocked me deeply. I should have expected anything but a public challenge from a lavateur, someone like you. You, you. you have challenged me publicly. Since you recall the confidential conversation, see it's all in here. Uh, this, I hope you, do you mind my reading this? This is all pretty good. I have with you and your friends, I'll try to edit it as I go if I see stuff that can go out. In my home, you cannot have forgotten how I often attempt to shift the discussion from religious issues to more neutral, conventional topics, and how strongly you and your friends had to prod me before I would venture to express my views on these matters, that is, on Jesus or Christianity or whatever, <clears throat> which top or touch upon man's deepest convictions. Unless memory betrays me, I was assured on these occasions 
that our conversations would be kept confidential. I would, of course, rather be mistaken in my recollection than accuse you of a breach of, of, of faith. Well, he obviously is accusing him of that. Nevertheless, you could easily have foreseen how repugnant it would be to me to issue a public statement about these matters after I had carefully tried to avoid discussing them. Okay, so he goes on in, in that vein. My disinclination to enter into religious controversy has, however, never been the result of fear of folly. My study of the foundation of my religious faith does not date from yesterday. Very early in life, I had already become aware of the need to examine my views and actions and the principal reason for which I have spent my leisure time since then in the study of philosophy and the humanities was precisely that I wanted to prepare myself for this task. And he goes on in that, in that vein. Um, so finally he goes on and said, if my decision after all these years of study had not been entirely in favor of my religion, I would certainly have found it necessary to make my convictions known publicly. If I were indifferent to both religions, or mocked or scorned all revelation, I might indeed follow the counsel with expedient, which expediency dictates while conscience remains silent. Uh, I would not be afraid. Anyway, finally he says, I do not deny that I see certain human excesses and abuses that tarnish the beauty of my religion, my, my, my inherited one. There are excesses there that he considers and abuses. But there is, is there any friend of truth who can claim that his religion is completely free of man-made accretions and corruptions? All of us know that the search for truth can be impeded by the poisonous breath of hypocrisy and superstition. Yeah, I wish all people today did know that. <laughs> Nevertheless, of the validity of the essentials of my faith, I am as firmly and irrefutably convinced as you or Mr. Bonnet are <coughs> of yours. And I declare before God, who created and sustained both you and I, that the God in whose name you have challenged me, that I shall adhere to the principles as long as my soul remains unchanged. My inner remoteness from your religion has remained unchanged since I disclosed my views to you and your friends in earlier conversations. And I would even now be prepared to concede that my respect for the moral stature of your founder has not diminished since then, etc., etc., etc. Still, I admit that I would never have entered into a dispute about Judaism even if it had been polemically attacked or triumphantly held up to scorn in academic textbooks. There would have been no uh, counter-argument from me, even against the most ridiculous notion which anyone, whether trained or merely semi-literate in the field of rabbinics, might have discovered in some literary trash that no serious-minded Jew bothers to read. I want to refute the world's derogatory opinion of the Jew by righteous living, not by pamphleteer. So anyway, his approach is righteous living. You see... Uh, I don't want to read this whole thing. Uh, well, I'll give you just a couple more paragraphs, okay? Just so you get the taste of it. Um, uh, however, it's not only my station of life, but also my religion and my philosophy that furnished me with the most cogent reasons why I wanted to avoid these controversies. According to the principles of my religion, I am not expected to try to convert anyone not born into my faith. Even though many people think the, that the zeal of proselytizing originated in Judaism, it is in fact completely alien. Our rabbis hold unanimously that what that the written as well as the oral laws that constitute our revealed religion are binding only for our own people. Now he's getting into the the, the, the nitty-gritty which he'll get into in Jerusalem further. That the oral laws and the uh, written ones that make up rabbinic Judaism are binding only, I'll go into that next time more, only on our own people. Moses gave us the law and his inheritance of the house of Jacob, quotes Deuteronomy. All other nations were enjoined by God to observe the law of nature and the religion of the patriarchs. All who live in accordance with the religion of nature, you see there's natural religion he's bringing in, and of reason are called the righteous among the nations. They too are entitled to eternal bliss. Far from being obsessed by any desire to proselytize, our rabbis require us to discourage as forcefully as we can anyone who has to be converted. People come to me and other classes I've had them say, you know, I wanted to convert to Judaism. I went to the rabbi and he discouraged me. I said, yeah, because he wanted you to come back several times and you didn't understand that uh, he's obliged to discourage you. That's part of his uh, training. If you had gone back three or four times, he would have accepted you, but you accepted his discouragement and went away, discouraged, uh, because that's what he's supposed to do. He's not supposed to convert someone unless they really want to be converted. <laughs> And they, they're like, what? You mean if I'd gone back, he would I said, yeah, if he'd gone back two or three times, he probably would have, uh, would have changed his mind. But you just went away. <laughs> you listened to him. You didn't want, 
he, he didn't want either way. He, 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 he didn't want you to listen to him in effect. He did, but he didn't. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, this is true. I'm going to comment on this in a minute. We are going to ask uh, um, him to consider the heavy burden he would have to convert the shoulder needlessly by taking this step. We are to point out, and this is true, that in his present state he's obligated to fill only the Noachic laws, the laws, uh, the laws incumbent upon Noah, in order to serve uh, to be saved. But that upon his conversion he would have to uh, observe strictly all the laws. Paul goes into this in his letter. Paul says, don't, uh, don't circumcise yourself, don't do this, don't do that, because then you'll have to take the Mosaic law by yourself, and that's too harsh, don't do it, you know, and so on and so forth. Jesus Christ is sufficient for you, and, and, and this is, I'm um, summarizing, this is in Galatians. I'm being kind to Paul here. <laughs> uh, Paul says much more than that, but uh, in any case, uh, this is what Mendelssohn is saying 1,700 years later. My God, we haven't moved very far, have we? Uh, in order to be saved, that upon the conversion you'll have to observe strictly all the laws. Hey, uh, I don't observe, I don't even know what the laws are, and I don't tend to observe anything that is annoying to me. So uh, I don't know what Mendelssohn is talking about, but uh, uh, no one questions what I am. So frankly, uh, you know, Mendelssohn is much more conservative than any of us in this room here. Uh, maybe some of you, but any of the people that I'm familiar with, or any of the people you're likely to meet. So you see, this is only two or three hundred years ago. Things have changed a lot since then. Uh, so finally, we are to paint, paint a picture of the misery and destitution of our people and of the contempt in which they are held in order to keep him from a hasty decision that he may later regret. This is very, very vivid, and uh, that's why I read it to you. We are not to send missionaries to the Indies or Greenland. Uh, as long as we do not want to convince or convert others, we have no quarrel with them. You know, what's your problem with us? If a Confucian or a Solon were living among our contemporaries, I could, according to my religion, love and admire the great man without succumbing to the ridiculous desire to convert him. Convert Confucius or Solon? Why? Why? Why would I want to do that? He's not a member of the household of Jacob. Our religious laws do not apply to him. As far as the general principles of religion are concerned, we should have little trouble agreeing on them. Do I think he can be saved? It seems to me anyone who leads men in virtue in, in this life cannot be damned in the next. Fortunately, I need not fear that I shall have to defend my views before an academic board of inquiry, etc., 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 etc. Then he, uh, he finishes over here. These are the reasons rooted in my religion and philosophical convictions for which I certainly avoid religious controversy. If you add to them the circumstances of my life and my fellow man, I'm sure you will find my position justified. I'm a member of an oppressed people which must appeal to the benevolence of the government for protection and shelter, as should you do, which are not always granted and never without limitations. Content to be tolerated and protected, my fellow Jews willingly forego liberties granted to every other human being, barred even from temporary residence in many countries. They consider it, this is uh, very accurate and very uh, you know, informative that he says it, not me. Uh, they, uh, at the time, barring from temporary residence in many countries, they consider it no small favor when a nation admits them under tolerable conditions. As you know, your circumcised friend, meaning himself, may not even visit you in Zurich, where this uh, minister obviously lives, because of the laws of your own hometown. Thus, my co religionists owe much grateful appreciation to any government that shows that humanitarian consideration permits them without interference to worship the Almighty in the ways of their fathers. They enjoy a fair amount of freedom in the country in which I live, Germany or Berlin. Should they therefore attack their protectors on an issue of, of which men of virtue are particularly sensitive, or would it not be more fitting if they abstain from religious disputes with the dominant creed? I have read your translation of Bonnet's essay with close attention. After everything I have already said, I hope there can be no longer any doubt as to whether I found his arguments convincing. In addition, however, I must confess that I do not consider his reasoning even adequate as a defense of the Christian religion, as you seem to do. And then he finally goes on. Uh, but I have the impression that Mr. Bonnet's personal convictions in laudable zeal, that's the work the fellow translated, lead, led him to ascribe to his truth a cogency that no one else can see. Most of his conclusions do not follow from his premises, etc. What amazes me, however, is that you, sir, consider this study of sufficient caliber to convert a man, me, whose principles must be diametrically opposed to it. It's probably impossible for you to project yourself into the mind of someone for whom these views are not foregone conclusions, but who must first be persuaded of their validity. If you attempted to do this, yet still believe as you do that Socrates himself should have found Monsieur Bonnet's proofs irrefutable, it can only mean that one of us must be a remarkable example of the influence which prejudice and upbringing exert 
even on those who search for the truth within their heart. And there's a little more. But that, that's, a, that's a tremendous response. That is Mendelssohn's response to Lavater. And the reason I read it to you before Jerusalem, I think it paints the character of the man, right? So you get a sense of the man. Now what we'll do next time, we really will, we'll go through Jerusalem as fast as we can, and then we'll move on to see the effect in the future lectures and, and discussions of what Jerusalem produced in the Jewish community. Yeah. So can you, can you uh, give me some sort of reading indication of where Yeah, I think I can now, because I, I think we finally got into the meat. And uh, I think we'll get, I think as we go along this class, it gets, it'll get better. Uh, and uh, because the readings, to me, are the key, and, 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 and they, I thought I had a, a syllabus here. Uh, it seems to have evaporated. Did anyone grab one of my syllabuses out of my Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, so look here. Um, yeah, so, so you know, you want to move along in this modern Jewish religious movements book. I don't know when we're going to get to all this stuff, but you want to read up to, as I was telling some of you, uh, uh, Neo-Orthodoxy, page 270, but I don't know if we'll ever cover it all. But if you read it all, you'll be well, it'll be well worth your while. So all the way through to 270, but don't get into the American uh, thing, 270, war and on to America. We're not going to deal with anything like that. I don't think we'll deal with Hasidism too much, which is, um, my colleague can teach you that. Uh, which is uh, blah, 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 where does it start? 116 to about 155, but it doesn't hurt you to read it. So I think this book up to about page 270, but how soon? Oh, the next three or four weeks, and we'll have an exam after that or something. And uh, then here, in this book here, I guess I did have that thing from Solomon Maimon. Yeah, I did. Have, I, I guess I did. Have. Well, we want to read um, everything here. Uh, the Onset of Change, New Views of Western Europe, Dome, Emancipation of French Jewry, we just did co Tortured Jewry, Reform Judaism, Israel Jacobson, Abraham Geiger, Wissenschaft of Judentum, the Science of Judaism School, and then the uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the Anti-Semitic Movements, Dreyfus, Jacques up to Dreyfus Jacques. Up to Dreyfus Jacques. What book is that? The source book. The source book. Up to Dreyfus Jacques. I mean, these are very, I'm going to cover them in the class. These are very simple readings, but they're a lot of fun. You can even get a pretty good sense just by reading the introduction zone of what. Yeah. And that's what I did, and then yeah. the rest of the readings. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's great stuff to have the actual documents, because to read, to read actually what Dreyfus said. You know, and also to read um, later on Herzl's reaction to it, and then um, you know, look at anti-Semitic stuff and and uh, how Reform Judaism. So we'll do the you know, in, in looking at uh, Israel Jacobson and some of these others who come after Mendelssohn, we'll see how Reform Judaism develops out of this, and so on. But Rudowski is very good to show the conservative reaction. And the uh, and the neo orthodox reaction. I'm not going to do too much neo orthodox stuff, but you should do it. So you got more time than me. You read it up to those pages that I told you. Yeah, do your work till the midterm or something. Is that, is that the Jerusalem one? Thank you. you already read that, didn't you? No. Read. No. <laughs> uh, let me see. Let me cut this off a little. Yeah. There she goes. <laughs>